We would like to start our session number two. Uh, there's, I would like to introduce the moderator again, Mr. David Hobbs, Dr. David Hobbs. I'm not a doctor. Okay, Mr. David Hobbs. Uh, David was the head of research at the King Abdullah Petroleum and Research Studies and also head of strategy for IHS market. Uh, please, David, this is your panel. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Walid, and, and thank you everyone for uh, coming in uh, away from the caffeine and, and the sugar uh, to something that hopefully will be intellectually nourishing uh, for us today. I'm, I'm delighted uh, to have uh, not just one, but two panels of very distinguished um, uh, colleagues. Um, I'm not going to read their biographies because I'd far rather use that time to hear what they have to say uh, rather than something that you can read yourself. And if you can't read it yourself, then this panel's probably going to go over your head anyway. Um, so it's, it's not worth uh, <laughs> worrying about, uh, about that. Um, so I have uh, His Excellency Mr. Cesar Abi Khalil, uh, the former Minister of Energy, uh, um, Professor Bassam Fatou, uh, who leads the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, uh, Dr. Walid Kadouri, who really needs no introduction as an economist in the region, um, and uh, the most recognizable probably of all of us is Dr. Khamal um, uh, Wazni, um, who uh, this, this is one of the few times that you will see him in the flesh rather than on television. Um, but uh, he's not just a pretty face, he's, he's uh, many years uh, as an academic also. So, so we have four people who are really w very well qualified to, to help us to understand the backcloth to all of the discussions today in terms of uh, the Middle East energy markets, the Middle East uh, uh, energy economy. Um, and I think that, that by way of, of introduction, um, really what I want to, uh, to say is that what a difference a decade makes. That I, I mentioned earlier, 10 years ago, uh, this conversation would have been a completely different conversation. It would have been about reliance on imports. It would have been about uh, how to uh, overcome the challenges of energy insecurity and energy shortage. And yet today, we're having as much trouble talking about the challenges of energy abundance and potential energy abundance. And so what I want us to do uh, during this, this next hour is to... Um, Start, at, uh, start with Lebanon and, and move out into the region, and, and there's no one better to kick us off um, than His Excellency. Uh, maybe you could talk to us a little bit about the Lebanese energy economy, how it, uh, what challenges it faces, and how engagement with the broader region and, and the resource abundance in the, broad, in the broader region provides greater opportunity. So Your Excellency. Good morning. Uh, of course, we can do it either way look at the Middle East and narrow down to Lebanon or, or the other way around. Well, about Lebanon, Lebanon has always been an energy importer. We've always relied on importing the energy for electricity production, for, uh, for transportation, for heating. So, so far we've been an energy importer. Since uh, 2009 and the, and the last decade you've been describing, Exploration, uh, exploration works, starting with the uh, seismic surveys, the interpretation of the seismic surveys, the issuance of the Lebanese offshore petroleum resources, low, the subsequent implementation decrees, the rules and regulations, uh, ha has always put us on a track to become an energy producing country. We have uh, conducted a successful first uh, licensing round in uh, of last year, two in 2018. We are uh, scheduled to start first drilling in December of this year, 15th of December uh, of this year, we will have the first drill ship in situ to start drilling, you know, drilling a, drilling a, uh, a well will take around 55 days, so beginning of 2020, we hope to have a commercial discovery. It is true that the probability of success in any other region would be 1 over 11, and that's a, 
that's a number you hear, you, you hear uh, all the time. But in Lebanon, we have increased our probability of success to 37%. And why is that? Because during the political crisis, during the presidential vacancy, during uh, the time we had caretaker governments, we were not sitting on our hands. We were continuing with our uh, geophysical surveys. We were interpreting the acquired data. We were doing some basin modeling and we have a pretty good look on what lies in our, in our seabed. So, uh, so all, all this has helped us to increase our probability of success to 37%, and that, wa that was what helped us to have eight points more than the international average in, in, in comparable provinces and in comparable uh, first bid rounds. We had eight points more than the than the uh, international the world and uh, average because we had we, we had a higher probability of success in uh, in our uh, in our region well now to, to 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 speak a little bit more broadly you know the international energy agency the the world energy outlook of 2018 of the international energy agency stipulates that the energy demand is projected to increase by 27% until 2040. The share of natural gas is projected to increase of three points in the energy mix, and the energy demand is projected to increase more than 90% in the Middle Eastern countries. So the natural gas will have a larger, a larger share of the energy mix, despite the renewables getting cheaper, more reliable, and more available. Moreover, the varied growth between, uh, in, in the global energy demand and supply markets will, will, will be difficult to, to balance out without the trade, the international, the international trade. As a result, increasing global energy demand declining production in mature provinces, and new discoveries such as the East Med has, 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 made, has made it that has helped to create uh, markets, hubs, alliances, all of that to secure, the, to secure energy, energy security, to ensure uh, energy security. So uh, furthermore, the distances between the supply areas and the demand areas will also foster a growing LNG, uh, a growing LNG market because it isn't always possible to build pipelines. There's no doubt that gas delivered, natural gas delivered through pipelines is the cheaper. But we've witnessed many times that gas has been interrupted because you know, pipelines across many geographies, the geopolitical situation. In 2011, we were importing natural gas from, uh, from Egypt. We had for 11 months natural gas from Egypt. And then the, the, the gas pipeline was, was bombed in the Sinai Peninsula, and gas was interrupted. That year, we managed to save $225 million dollars per year just in fuel because we had used, we had fired one turbine, one of the two turbines of Deir Amar on natural gas. We, 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 we saved a quarter of a billion dollars during 11 months just for using the natural gas that year. So this is to say that the LNG market is probable to grow. The LNG will, will, will continue to be a a solution, an, alter, uh, an alternative. So in the last decade, as you've mentioned, the discoveries in the region, Tamar, Leviathan, Aphrodite, Zohr, all these discoveries, all these discoveries has made that the uh, interest in our region has peaked. And uh, of course, the, the development of these discoveries will need to ensure markets for them. 
we don't have a market to sell the, 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 the gas, so no one will fund the development of the, of, uh, of the fields. And that's what made governments come together to find frameworks for collaboration between themselves and to find fi funding for the needed infrastructure. And we've always heard about and witnessed, heard about projects like the East Med Pipeline, the uh, East Med Gas Forum that has, been, that has been organized in Egypt, the tripartite, the tripartite conventions that are being, uh, you know, that we're witnessing everywhere. A couple of months back, the the, the, the ministers of uh, the ministers of Cyprus and 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 Greece were here in Lebanon. There was a discussion. Um, th th there was a tripartite discussion, tripartite discussions, uh, bilateral discussions. They're all happening now to ensure the frameworks between between the countries uh, to find markets, to find markets, and to find the proper uh, the proper funding for the development. Of those of those fields and of the infrastructure that would be necessary, that would be necessary uh, to convey and to transport the uh, the produced uh, the produced uh, uh, gas. Uh, on another on another hand, there is an accelerated uh, pace for uh, launching uh, licensing rounds in the region, more acreage is being uh, offered for investors uh, to develop. Uh, of course, we are benefiting of a strategic, strategic position we are uh, next to Europe, which is a big continent hang hungry for, 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 for energy. It's 75% energy deficient. Of course, uh, energy is being, the, the, uh, is being provided by the Russian gas. We might uh, constitute, we might constitute <clears throat> a substitute to a share, however small it is, from that, uh, from that part, and that also, uh, that also uh, indicates or that also uh, explains the interest of the Russian companies in, uh, in our licensing, uh, in our licensing grounds. We've seen uh, Novatec in consortia in Lebanon and in uh, and in in Cyprus, we've seen Rusneft in uh, in in Egypt. We've seen Rusneft in Tripoli, also uh, in in the mid in, in the midstream sector. Uh, so uh, our region is uh, is is now highly interesting for for the investors. Lebanon Lebanon intends to. Uh, to be present on the map, to be an alternative for that, we have demonstrated through the first licensing round that we have we have one of the most modern legal frameworks, most predictable and transparent legal frameworks. We uh, we announced our intention to abide or to join the EITI, the Extractive uh, Industries Transparency Initiative. We have adopted some re recommendations of the EITI in a law. So some recommendations, when it is a recommendation, you're free to implement it or no. Well, if you implement it, then they will say, great, you did great. If you don't implement it, they'll frown upon you. But there is no legal consequences. But in Lebanon, this has been put forward in a law. The transparency enhancement law in the petroleum sector that has been passed by, uh, passed by the Lebanese uh, parliament and it is, uh, it is in vigor now. So Lebanon disposes of a, of a, uh, of a uh, very good, uh, very good, uh, highly, highly rated uh, investment uh, environment. Uh, this has been demonstrated in the first licensing round and we hope uh, we will have a second successful licensing round in, uh, in, in the coming year. This will accelerate the exploration works, the exploration uh, activities in our, uh, in our maritime waters, and this will increase our, 
our probability to have a commercial discovery at the, at the soonest. Thank you, and, and thank you for bringing it back to Lebanon, because the, as you say, the global environment matters, and, and the global environment is one that many of the local population will also be subconsciously aware. And when a big discovery is made, often the first thing that goes through the minds of the population now we're going to have to decide what color of Ferrari we will all drive now that we have this resource wealth. Um, that's, uh, and, ha and so the other side of the equation is how, do you, uh, how did you as a minister and how do you as part of civil society moving forward set the expectations of the population to allow the vision that you've just described to actually be delivered rather than resource populism coming and, and, and uh, undermining all of that good work? Well, we worked on two different uh, levels or two different fronts. Of course, we worked on the on the uh, on a communication front, where uh, whereas we managed, we always managed the expectations of the population. We n we've never, at the ministry, in the last ten years, has never put forward any estimation, any number, any high uh, uh, expectations. For the, populations to for the population to start, you know, uh, uh, dreaming, dream, yeah. dreaming th 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 that's it. And on the other hand, the offshore petroleum resources law stipulates that the, uh, uh, that the revenues of the petroleum activities should be invested in a sovereign wealth fund. And the proceeds of the, the, proceeds of the, uh, of the investments should be re-injected in the in the uh, sovereign wealth fund in a way to grow it, to be able to serve a growing number of Lebanese in the, in the future, and only part of it could be injected in the, in the, uh, in the, in, in the economy. Yeah. Uh, so, and I personally presented a uh, proposal law. I had prepared it as a project law when I was uh, at, at the ministry, and two weeks, two, two weeks ago, I had submitted it as a, as a proposal law to to, to the parliament. When you're, a, when you're a minister, you need all the council of ministers to approve it, so to send it, to send it to the parliament. But when you come a parliamentarian, you only need your signature. So I, I, submitted, I submitted it uh, a couple of weeks ago, and hopefully we will have a workshop at the, at, at the parliament to discuss this, uh, to discuss this uh, proposed law, this proposed, uh, this proposed law, and, and pass it as, uh, at the soonest. It is true, it is not imminently necessary as the proceeds of the, of, of, of the, of the oil activities won't, won't, be, won't be that imminent. It will, we will need time to, uh, to prove a commercial discovery, to, uh, to appraise the data of the first wells that have been uh, drilled, to develop, the, to develop the, the, the fields and then to start to start exporting the hydrocarbons to have the inflow of, of the money. So this is still a lengthy process. We're not talking about next year or the year after. We're talking about four to five years to come. If we are very lucky, it will be, it will be four, 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 four years. So we, we have plenty of time to pass a, uh, a, the proper regulation, the proper, the proper law to be able to ensure the, uh, th th this wealth for the future generations. And, and, and to, 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 clo to close here, uh, we've had one of the most transparent law to govern the petroleum activities. We intend to have a parallelly most transparent law to manage the wealth because the, the, end, the, 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 the end goal is to transform this depletable natural resource into a renewable financial resource. So if we do our best to have the most professional, to, 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 to do our extraction, the exploration and production activities with the most transparent and professional, uh, pro professional uh, way, we have to do the same to manage the resulting, the resulting wealth. So this has to be, uh, this ha has, has to match the first legal framework. So, so Walid, you've, you've lived through this in Egypt, the, uh, 
the, the, the hype of expectations, the, the disappointment of becoming an importer, and now the, the new optimism. Tell us, tell us the Egyptian story. I think Egypt is moving ahead to, to become a hub. It's still some way from there, but moving ahead to that. The, others, the other countries have failed to be a hub. For example, Turkey, which was the first nom nominee to be a hub, uh, tried to have the pipeline, Egypt, Palestine, Gaza, Israeli gas, and if possible, <coughs> and then move it to Turkey, and from Turkey, it goes to Europe. Like the East Europeans and the, uh, like the former Soviet Union republics and Russia is doing. But that, that idea failed. Turkey is now, has bad relations, I, I mean, I, I, I use the word bad, with several Middle East countries. And it's not uh, Cyprus, for example, definitely. They, are not, they have challenged Cyprus and their sovereignty over the exclusive economic zone. Uh, their relation with Egypt is not very good. They have a conflict. So I doubt Turkey will become a hub. Uh, Israel tried and, and, and talked a lot about being a hub. But the trouble with Israel, the, you know, they thought first of uh, having an, uh, construct LNG plants near Haifa, but the, it seems security-wise that was not good because it's too close. Any armed conflict, the LNG plants could be a target. And then they are talking now, they, are, they have been talking for a long time, about the pipeline through Cyprus, Greece, and Italy. But I don't understand that pipeline. I mean, you build a pipeline of that sort without a customer so far. It doesn't make sense to me. European Union has uh, showed its interest in the pipeline, but there's no customer yet. So how do you build a pipeline expensive? like that without a customer and, and so I doubt that idea will float anytime soon. Cyprus tried to build an LNG plant uh, near Limassol with the Cypriot and Israeli gas. And they had the financial crisis uh, problem in Cyprus uh, and so they, they dropped the idea. So now only Egypt is left as a, as a hub. Egypt has uh, corrected, has really uh, transformed its Oil structure and gas, oil and gas structure in the last five years, and the discovery of Zohar Field, the largest field in the Mediterranean, has made a difference. However, Egypt has to continue finding large reserves year after year to meet their, their domestic consumption is increasing five percent annually, and they are a population of 104 million, approximately. So Egypt needs to discover more and more gas. They adopted a two-pronged policy in Egypt. One to be self-sufficient in gas. Domestic gas is, uh, domestic production goes to the domestic market. The LNG plants were are stand, standing idle near Alexandria and Demyat and uh, Etco there. And uh, they have been idle for some time now because of lack of supply. They are going to receive regional gas. Now what do we mean by regional gas? From Israel and Cyprus. And what exactly? Basically they want to go after the small fields that are many of the, Israel has about 10 fields. Uh, two are uh, major fields. The rest are small, one to three, uh, you know, BTF. So they are not, com not economic to really, to use for export, uh, for long distance to Europe or that. So Egypt wants to tap these fields gradually, and in Cyprus also, like Aphrodite, and supply the LNG plants in, on the Mediterranean with imported gas, so re-export of gas as LNG. In that sense, Egypt will transform itself into a hub. Plus, Egypt, of course, has the Suez canals and Sumit for oil. So it has the oil coming from the Gulf, plus gas in the East Mediterranean. So it can build a bursa for gas for the East Med. And also, oil is already, you know, Egypt is a hub through the transit system. And Egypt has gone a step further, what you uh, said about the meeting the, for, uh, the East Mediterranean Gas Forum, which was held earlier this year in January. And it had, you know, several countries, uh, not Lebanon, uh, but uh, Egypt, uh, Palestine Authority, Israel, Cyprus, Jordan, Greece, and Italy. So producing, consuming, and transit countries participated. It's important for Egypt to have that, but that really installed it as the Hub. But the problem with that forum, in my opinion, it brought Israel into, right into the Arab energy sector. 
and which is going to cause problems in the future. Lebanon did not participate. I don't know if it was invited, but not participated. Syria is a big problem, whether to participate or not. I'm not sure. So that is going to be a problem for Egypt. The regional, uh, the regional uh, political problems with Israel and the mid like a founding father of that forum is going to be, it could be a problem, unless there's a, a, a peace in the area, that comprehensive peace which will overtake all these things. But I don't see that very, coming very soon, despite all the developments. What does the hub mean? What does a hub mean for Egypt? A hub means you can have a bourse, a bourse for uh, uh, pricing the gas. There we don't have a price for gas in the Middle East yet, for East Med, the whole East Med. There's no price formula. Europe has a price formula. East Asia has a price formula. Uh, East Med, uh, Mediterranean, the whole Middle East doesn't have a price formula for gas. Egypt could develop that with the East Med gas as a bourse there. Also, it could develop industry along the new Suez Canal that's being constructed, that has been constructed, uh, shipbuilding, uh, in fact, industry, employment, and investments there. I don't see anyone, any contender with, for Egypt, with, with Egypt for that position as a hub. It's coming. It's going to take some time. The politics has to be made correct. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I, that's... Uh I would describe that as the optimistic case um, that, that treats the outcome of uh, a hub and some kind of pricing discovery uh, vehicle as inevitable, and, and it's a question of working out how to get there. Well, uh, what, what do you see? That is necessary. We have to have a price for Eastman gas. You cannot, we cannot, each country cannot go on exporting its gas and so on. There has to be a price formula. Otherwise, there'll be competition, there'll be cutthroat prices. So the EastMed countries have to have a full price formula to export to Europe, in that sense, or even regionally. Uh, without that, there'll be too much competition and too much price, cut price throat. So, so competition would undermine investment in the EastMed as well? Not undermine investment. It will cut the price uh, of gas if there's no price formula. Right. So you're related to rent or to other gases, but you have to relate it to something, and you price it accordingly. It's going to the same markets, either Europe or regionally. So what are you going to do with it? So Bassam, I know you have some, some views on, on hubs. Uh, we, I don't think we need the, uh, the slides um, exactly. So, so, so far away, no, don't worry about the slides. We'll... No, no, he doesn't, need, he doesn't need them, that's fine. Go <coughs> ahead, so, so tell me what, what your view is on, on hubs. Uh, I just want to uh, unpick uh, the point actually that you made in the, in the first session is that one need to realize that the context around the East Med gas has really fundamentally transformed in terms of the geopolitics, the, mi the market structure, uh, the pricing structure, and also the, the challenges that are facing the oil and gas industry in a time when everyone is transitioning. And I think uh, to appreciate these structural transformations, I, uh, you know, I always try to discuss them in the context of Europe and why Europe. For the simple uh, fact, and we, we heard this view, that uh, uh, always the East Med gas is being presented as one way for Europe to diversify away from Russian supply. Or, as you said, you know, it might be a small percentage, but nevertheless. And now we are seeing a lot of political arguments against Russian dominance in Brussels and uh, many EU capitals, but recently in the US, and what is quite interesting is that the U U.S. administration has grown increasingly vocal in opposition uh, to the North, uh, North Stream 2 project, which basically is taking Russian gas uh, to Germany and, uh, and Europe. And to me, you know, this argument of the East Med as a presented as a way to diversify European gas supplies, uh, I find this argument uh, not only not convincing, but I also find it quite harmful. And, you know, a country like Lebanon, you know, should be very, very careful trying to position, to position themselves in, the, in that way. And I would like to, to emphasize why this is uh, the case. First of all, if you look at the European market fundamentals, on the demand side, really, all of the projections basically expect European gas demand up to 2030 to increase a bit, but after 2030 for gas demand actually to start declining. 
and this is a result of renewables, this is a result of efficiency measures, uh, this is a result of, uh, of uh, many, many factors. So we cannot really take for granted that European gas demand is likely to continue to increase. On the supply side, there is no doubt that they are, uh, we're seeing some decline in production, for instance, in a country like Netherlands. But at the same time, you know, the, the availability of gas supplies in Europe is really uh, tremendous. If you look at the Russian spare capacity uh, that can actually go to, to Europe, it's basically quite tremendous. If you look also at the LNG that is coming from the US, and now Qatar with uh, increasing its capacity and diverting away from, uh, uh, from Asia, is going to basically start diverting more and more of gas of its LNG into Europe. So you need to really think of Europe as the sinking ground for gas. So whenever there's unwanted gas all over the world is basically going to go to, to, uh, to Europe. And that basically means that uh, the prices in Europe are likely to, be, uh, to, to, be, to remain quite low. I think the other very, very important uh, uh, change as well we are seeing is that in a liberalized market and globalized LNG market, there is really reluctance to sign 20 to 25 year contracts. I think those days are, are, are gone. These old days of financing and trying to shift the risk to the consumer, I think these really are behind us. And without really long term contracts, it's going to become more increasingly difficult to finance the LNG projects and, and, and the pipeline, as Walid uh, was mentioning, that you, know, you really basically need to have, uh, uh, to have uh, clients. I think the, the third, also quite an important point, is that nobody will sign an oil price link contract nowadays. It's going to be the hub. You know, there are hub prices in Europe, and basically you have to accept that you're going to net back from these, uh, from these hub uh, prices. Uh, the final point that I would like to make on this global context is the fact that, you know, pipelines have become really increasingly very difficult to build. And there are very few major pipelines, other than Russia to the Far East and Russia to Europe. And even with the problem with Russia to Europe, Really, we, we cannot see, you know, these pro big projects of pipeline. The world is increasingly moving towards more and more towards LNG. And I think, you know, uh, what we're trying basically to reinvent in the region towards building all of these, you know, pipe, pipeline dreams and this idea of, you know, we're going to have all of this pipeline connecting these countries, I really don't uh, buy into this. So uh, what does this mean, what does this mean uh, you know, for the East Med gas? Uh, we're talking about an area with the limited gas reserves, and I'm, I'm talking here compared to other countries like Qatar and Russia, and the much more expensive gas. And if you really want to compete in Europe, if you're going to get the gas there in the price of six, seven dollars per MBBTU, I don't think you really have a chance. Which basically takes me to the point that you made earlier, is that the rents are likely to be very, very small. And I think, you know, we really should not hype expectations that this is going to be transformational for the region. Uh, where I see really the impact is likely to be on the domestic economies, like a country like Lebanon that does not have gas and the power mix, environmental uh, uh, benefits. But this idea that you're going to basically create a big dividends and big dividends that's going to bring these countries together, I think this is really another myth. The idea that, you know, oil, uh, sorry, gas trends are going to bring the countries of the region together and cooperate. Actually, history tells us that uh, resource rents actually create conflict, you know, all over the region. Also, the idea of shared facilities, you know, I really, you know, been looking very, very hard for, uh, for examples to see that countries accept to share their facilities. This idea that Cyprus, Israel will send their gas to Egypt, they will acquire there and use the, uh, the existing infrastructure. You know, give me an example from anywhere in the world that actually people are willing to, to do this type of, uh, of cooperation. So I think really we, we really should uh, be careful in terms of trying to hype expectations, in terms of uh, the regional role of this East Med gas, also in terms of the size of the rents. And that takes me to, to the idea of this uh, of sovereign wealth fund. You know, in a country like, like Lebanon, really the idea of a sovereign wealth fund you know, it you know, should really be uh, studied very carefully. You, you, you know, you've, you have a country which is suffering from massive underinvestment in pu public infrastructure, in roads, in electricity. And this idea that you take this money and move it away from the public infrastructure and you put it in a sovereign wealth funds for the future generation, I think this should really be examined very, very carefully. Uh, you know, there are a lot of arguments against this idea because 
you know, that, re that money that you actually put in the public infrastructure now can give you a much higher rate of return than putting it in a sovereign wealth fund that basically gives you, I don't know, 3 4%. You know, that's something that we really so we should not replicate, you know, just the fact that uh, we've taken some examples from Norway it does not mean that everything from Norway we should replicate here. Every country has its own specific context. I, I complete, I'm, I'm delighted that it sounds like we're going to have a debate. Um, and, but before we launch into that debate, um, Kamal, I, I think that you are, I've, I've come to you last because I, I was worried that Bassam would be too optimistic, and he was indeed too optimistic. Uh, tell him why he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, when we have to talk about the situation of Lebanon and oil and gas and all the whole discovery, we've been listening to a lengthy process as going to be within five, six years. And probably we're going to listen to that for a very long time. And uh, I think the competition out there become very tough having the United States decided to enter that market and to decided to be a major exporter to uh, Europe. And it seemed that the pressure from the United States is great during the Trump administration. We heard uh, President Trump when he was speaking with the German, ex-German Chancellor uh, Merkel when he said they are captive to, to, to Russia. We heard a couple days ago, maybe yesterday, uh, that he was probably thinking about putting sanction about uh, the the, 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 the pipeline that's going to come from Russia to, to, to Germany. So what I'm really concerned, and I wrote my paper about, it's really more than Lebanon. It's about the region, about the gas and oil, and the squandering opportunity. It's not, Lebanon is not really at this point where he was able to agree and and work very hard because there is a lot of politics and there is a lot of contentious issue with the region. And today we were hoping to hear good news because the American initiative and seem is something is not working at this point. Uh, but in the regional level, where we have gas and oil, and we have a lot of wealth, and supposedly that money and wealth supposed to create prosperity. And what we see, especially in the, uh, I want to say over the hundred years, that wealth did not create this great opportunity for the, the region. And now the region is facing probably one of the toughest, dangerous time we ever uh, we ever faced in this lengthy process. If you look just at the number that, uh, that we actually invested in arms trade, according to the study was made from Congressional Research Service, the Middle East is a main participant region in the global arm trade, constituting 61% of the value of arm agreement concluded by all supplier with the developing world from 2012 to 2015, and 54% from 2008 to 2011. Of the 57 major U.S. arms sales proposed in 2016, 35% were to nation in the Middle East. In 2017, the U.S. Department announced $75.9 billion worth of proposed sale, 52 billion of which were to the Middle Eastern state. This is really a sad story for the region because almost every state in the region is in war. 
So, I understand at one point that gas and oil has to make a positive change and a positive impact on the economic and prosperity. But the opposite is really happening. There's another study that related to military spending and how much damage it does to the economic development and reform effort in each state that went through war. There's this study, I'm not sure how accurate it is, but they assume that increase in military spending lead to slower economic growth. That's for sure, because we saw most of the Arab country, they're like uh, raising money through issuing debts. And we have high, um, high unemployment, and we have lack of opportunity. Over a 20-year period, a one increase in military spending will decrease a country economic growth by 9%. As far as the World Bank, he estimated recently, because of the war, 87 million people from four MENA countries. Now we can add additional country to the chaos and the uh, uh, tension uh, directly affected by war. Iraq, Libya, Syria, Yemen, now we can add Sudan, you can add Algeria, probably uh, there are more uh, uh, coming on line. What I'm saying, the statistics are startling. There's a lot of people that need humanitarian aid in many different parts of the world. I want to conclude that we can say that transformation of the Middle East in the 20th century started with the Western world desperate for oil and was followed by squandering of the region's God-given natural and economic resources and their inherent opportunity. What we need today as a MENA country, as an Arab country, as a Muslim country, as a humanitarian, to find a way that we can speak to each other so the God-given wealth to this region can be put to a good use. Otherwise, these wealths been used and misused in more war and confrontation, and that's really is a threatening issue for every one of us. If you have a child, you want to make sure that child live in a prosper, peaceful world. The gas and the oil and all the wealth did not deliver peace and stability to the region. I, there's so much to get into, and I'm, I'm going to come back to the panel in a second, but, but I'd, I'd like Prime Minister Signora to, to maybe respond to a little bit of that, because I know some of these points uh, Yes. Strike a chord. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to express my great appreciation for the interventions, very valuable interventions of the members of the panel. And I would like in here to express some few observations, which I don't want anybody to really uh, uh, think that I'm criticizing this in this way or that way. We, uh, we all believe that we have, all of us, an interest in developing this sector, particularly I'm talking about Lebanon. And this is in the interest of all to cooperate wisely and prudently in uh, developing this sector and managing the economy. The first observation that I'd like to really ma mention in here is that the uh, there has been a continuous 
work towards building up expectations that are unreasonable and imprudent. And this was used as an excuse, and this is the, the most damaging thing, as an excuse for not indulging in the proper reform that the economy needs. And this has really been delaying the necessary measures that should be taken by, by all those who are responsible, actually, about the economy and the government, so that we can, on the one hand, manage our economy well and manage this sector, this growing sector, particularly that we know that there are plenty of risks and hindrances pertaining to the sector. Uh, up till now, we don't know whether we have uh, uh, proven reserves or even with the quantities that are necessary to extract them or with the quantities that we need to justify building the transporting these, these uh, uh, let's say, this, this gas. So there are plenty of risks still remain while at the same time we are still building up more and more expectations in the minds of the people. We have seen as Lebanese over the past few years lots of panels all over the country in trying to really say that it is the, the right of every individual in the country to manage and to dream of this and that and so on. And still, as we, as we, as we say, there is a certain proverb uh, in Arabic that everybody is fighting with each other about the skin of the bear, and we did not catch the bear yet. Now let's, let's try to catch the bear, and so that we can really uh, 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 try to, to see how we can split that skin whenever we catch the bear. So this is something that has to be really put in our minds, that we need prudence and good judgment. And I'd like to really comment about, let's say, uh, uh, discussing and approving the new law that has to do with the sovereign funds. I'm not against actually discussing it and approving it, but the problem is that Again, this is, this is going to fuel more expectations, and we are going to have disagreement among all of us how to be represented in this sovereign fund. So everyone is, is trying to uh, 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 speed up in order to catch a place and to reserve a place for him. Each party is trying to really have a place in that sovereign fund. And see, all of these actually is part of a certain process that people are trying to see how to split the cake, but nobody is trying to really see how to expand and grow the cake. I'd like to really comment on something else that has to do with the, with the let's say, the energy sector and the guarding, is that knowing that there are so many years ahead of us before we can develop this gas sector. And you have mentioned, Your Excellency, that in, within a period of 11 months, we managed to reduce our bill regarding the, uh, uh, the, 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 the gas that we managed to import from Egypt. That was during the 2008-2009 period. Uh, we saved about $225 million. And still, we are still uh, fighting with each other whether we can use FSRUs or not. Why don't we carry on a process of FSRU for Tripoli? Why don't we? The point is that we will not agree to have an FSRU in Tripoli 
unless we have three other FSRUs. This is ridiculous. I mean, let's, it is proven that uh, having one FSRU in AAA, uh, probably the, uh, uh, the payback period for this will be just two or three years, I mean, which it will pay for itself. Less than that, your excellency. Even less. I mean, you, you are giving me more ammunition. Uh, why don't we do it? But that does not mean I agree with all of that you've said. No, no, we, this one, you no, 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 no. I'm not criticizing you, let me tell, put it this no, no, way. No, I understand. That this, let's try to look how we can argue about matters and discuss them in a very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, prudent way that would lead to, to results. I'm mentioning about the case of the FSRU, which is still actually being discussed and should have been actually implemented several years ago and would have saved a lot, actually. Still, we are not intending to do this anything before having three, three, three pieces. And before actually establishing a, gener a, a generation place in Salata. We'll do it, actually. But I mean, again, I mean, if you want to have so many places for generation electricity, we have to look about the economies of it. So what I really say in, uh, in, in summary is that what is required is greater level of responsibility and prudence and independence and enhancing the role of the regulatory authority and not to be under the, 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 the influence of the concerned ministry. There should be a proper regulatory authority that will be able to, to do its role and to have a real firewall between itself and the investors. These are the things. It is very important to reflect an image of good governance in this sector, which is still not there. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and uh, I'm going to ask I'm going to ask you to respond not not just to uh, yes, I, I, I know have, I, I have I saw you writing of furiously. <laughs> I, 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 so I will start with 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 uh, Dawlat Rais with His Excellency Prime Minister Signora, uh, and I will dissociate the internal politics from a very technical from a very technical response. So first, f first of all, I mentioned in my, in my first intervention the management of expectations and that has always been our concern. So if there has been a campaign 10 years back when we were trying to pass and to lobby for the uh, passing of the offshore petroleum resources law, that does not mean that we raised the expectations very high. I said we never released any number, any estimation. We always said prudent. Prudent is, is the word that figures maybe in every speech every minister of energy has, uh, has taken in this sector prudence. And even it is mentioned in the law, al intej al hadar wa rashid. So that is that is the the, 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 the the we concur we concur on that. Now, for do we have the oil or not? Well, if we have to go more, I I don't want to transform this into a very technical and very uh, G and G uh, G and G session. But we have both the. Uh, we have both the uh, Airbus satellite pictures, the uh, stains of oil, the leaks of oil coincide perfectly with the chimneys above the reservoirs. So we have what, 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 what we call the direct hydrocarbon indicators are there. I don't want to got to get but, more but, into... But just, more let's, let's just stop, stop the G&G &G by saying, yeah. as you said earlier, there's a one in three chance that you've got something yes. big and there's a two in three chance that you don't. That's right. That's, that's all people need to know. That's right. 
Now, 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 uh, now, now, uh, transporting, uh, transporting the produced gas, yes, the uh, Arab gas pipeline exists. The Arab gas pipeline links us to the north to Turkey, and it is finished till the Turkish border. And it was finished back in 2011. We are linked to the south, to Egypt, to the liquefaction, to the liquefaction plants. These are, these are ways of collaboration with the neighboring countries that we can explore. On the last day I was a minister, on the 31st of January, I met with uh, Minister Tari El Mullah, and that was the discussion to resume the importation of, of uh, natural gas from Egypt according to the contract that was signed in 2007. You were Prime Minister then, Daultak. Uh, we managed to import just in 2011 then for 11 months and half of the quant quantity that was, that was uh, contractual. Minister, Minister, Mullah, Minister Mullah confirmed to me on the 31st of January that they were able to give us all the quantity. Now there are some formalities because the gas is passing through Syria and how to pay the throughput fees and all of that, that is being discussed, of course. Now you can't, uh, I can't stress uh, enough the importance of the FSRUs. That's true, we faced uh, internal political problems for the FSRUs. We conducted a study that showed that the most economical one would be in Tripoli with a coastal pipeline. We launched the, the project as is during uh, very fierce political and civil unrest in, uh, in, in Tripoli, and where at that time I couldn't go visit the site. So we went that way, we had political hindrance, that's right. There has been a demand to have another one in the south, despite the economical uh, non-feasibility of the project, and that has stopped the project for so long. So with the five years of time, Five, five, five years elapsed, there was more uh, technology had evolved. Uh, FSRUs were getting smaller and cheaper. That's why we launched a tender with many, many, uh, many uh, FSRUs, with many alternatives for FSRUs and pipelines. So that, that, that's, on, uh, that, that's on the one side. There's, there's still an, n another thing I, I, I just want to send to close everything. Okay, I just want to make yeah. a, a point of, of um, whether, whether an ex-president outranks uh -oh. an ex-minister and whether I, Oh, no, you should, okay, that's fine. I, I, ju <laughs> I, I, I just want to talk about the sovereign wealth fund. Uh, I understand the concerns of uh, Dr. Fatouh and of the prime minister on that, on that side, but we have something that is called the total government take. Part of it is the taxes, and part of it is the government share. The government share would go to the sovereign wealth fund. The taxes, we have issued a law, and that was a project law that was prepared by the government I was in, Law 57, that leaves, and I understand the concern, that leaves uh, the judgment to the government whether, whether, uh, and according to the return, uh, according to the return, uh, you know, rates, whether, whether, uh, well, if you're borrowing money, borrowing money at 8%, and the sovereign wealth fund is giving you 4%, then of course you will not put the money in the sovereign wealth fund and go bor b uh, uh, borrow the money at, at 8%. So you will use the, 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 those proceeds. So this, this uh, flexibility is mentioned in Law 57, uh, uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Then we were, we, we were aware of that, we saw that, and we have, uh, we have put it into, into law. As for, uh, as, for, uh, as, for, as for Russia, when I spoke about Russia, I was explaining the interest of the Russian, uh, the Russian, uh, the Russian companies. I was, I was not placing Lebanon as an alternative to the Russian gas. I'm very well aware of the scales of the two countries and of the, 
uh, and of the uh, of the oh, and possibilities. I don't think, I don't think yes. that, that Bassam was seeing Lebanon positioning itself. America, I think, has seen the Eastern Mediterranean as, as something. Uh, President Jamal, I, I know you wanted to intervene, and then I'm going to come, Bassam and, and uh, Walid. I would like to raise a very quick question. I know very well that the uh, the Iraqis, the minister of oil in Iraq. Uh, told uh, explicitly that Iraq is uh, really willing to uh, provide the uh, certain quantities of oil and gas to Lebanon with a very, very special prices. I don't know why uh, the Lebanon didn't try to explore this possibility and uh, to be in touch with the Iraqis where they are really ready to give privileged prices to Lebanon. Mr. President, actually, that was a Lebanese demand. It wasn't a, an Iraqi proposal. So we asked for that, and we don't, have a, we don't have an approval. We have a pipeline that is still under pressure, that is linking Tripoli to Kirkuk. And part of it, the, the, our project in Tripoli, is to make Tripoli as an obligatory path for the export of the Iraqi crude, because we know very well that uh, Iraqis are struggling with their northern exit and southern exit that cannot uh, evacuate their, uh, their, their ramping up production or their project to ramp up their, their, uh, th their production. So we are, offering, we are offering a third exit which actually exists during the Nahr al-Barid uh, uh, events. The, uh, the, the, uh, the pipeline was, uh, what, what, what was hit and uh, the oil installations fixed it and the uh, crude that is still inside has protected all this time and it is still under pressure. So we have an asset that, could used, that, 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 could, that, could, be, that could be used. So, so one of the downsides of people saying so many provocative and interesting things is that we only have a few minutes left. Um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, we're going to have... There's a second part to this panel, which is already 15 minutes late. So what... Uh, okay, very quickly, and then I just want to give the other panelists an opportunity. Yeah. Just a few seconds. Yes, thanks. In 2004, the Iraqi Prime Minister, Ayad Alawi, was here. I was part of the delegation, and we offered to supply Lebanon with crude. The Syrians asked us to... Uh, let them do the supply through them. We said, no, Lebanon is a special case, and we signed a memorandum of understanding, but it was never followed up. Thanks for, for that clarification. Um, so I, I'm going to give you each a couple of minutes to say what you think we really should remember. So, uh, uh, well, uh, Bassam, go, go well uh, a couple of points on the, on the Iraqi gas and... Uh, uh, the Iraqis have been discussing with Kuwait for a long time the possibility of exporting some of the gas from Iraq to uh, uh, from Iraq to Kuwait, and the issue always boils down to price. You know, the problem in the region is that basically, you know, as Walid mentioned, you know, what is the pricing issues? Because every one, every time there's a pipeline gas, every importing country expects to get cheap gas, and what they don't realize that basically they have to pay a very high gas prices. Uh, but that's a minor point. I think one of the points that, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I have to say that, uh, you know, I'm going to disagree with, uh, with, Cam, uh, with Kamel. Uh, the way he painted a very negative uh, uh, picture about the oil wealth and the gas, uh, gas wealth in the region, and the fact that, you know, it basically reminds me very much of this oil curse. Uh, but, you know, uh, could we have managed the resources in the region better? Yes, of course we could have. But this idea that basically that resources did not create enough wealth, I find this very difficult to, uh, to, to believe and to basically counteract with, uh, with the actual facts. If you look at the development in the Gulf countries, that all the development human indicators in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of education, uh, mortality rates, for, you know, everything you know, in this region has, uh, has been improved. So there isn't really uh, anything fundamentally wrong with the oil sector as such. The problem is that with the weak institutions, and in the region as a whole, whether you are an oil-rich country or not, we have weak institutions. And the biggest example is Lebanon. So Lebanon, when you start with weak institutions, you know, you're likely you know, to, uh, to mismanage the, the wealth. 
there is nothing wrong with having, you know, a vibrant uh, sector. So, and all of this uh, talk about military spending, things like that, you know, uh, I, I've read some of this literature, and, and really one has to be very careful. But because we, need, we really don't need to give the impression as well that, you know, this is a resource that really cannot create wealth, and this is a resource that actually we could do better without it. Actually, no, we should be able to do better with it, and we should actually strengthen our institutions and manage it better. There is nothing intrinsically wrong with oil and gas. There's, there's, I, I don't recall, but, but Kamal, you can probably put me straight. Uh, was there any war or fighting in the region before oil was discovered? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, or, or, or without the oil and gas, for instance, what could Saudi Arabia be or what could Kuwait be? You know, that, well, like that's, that, that's so. a, a separate point. Look, so, so we are we're definitely, I'm, I'm not just getting uh, you know, harsh stares. I'm now starting to get people making that kind of motion at me. Um, so I want to give Walid, one point. Uh, exactly, and, and Kamal, if there's one thing you want people to remember. I think today. we should look at um, Arab, or Arab gas markets. It's expanding and we should... Uh, put more attention to it. I mean, Dr. Ahmed Atiqa this morning talked about the power sector, the largest investment, you know, tri trillion dollars coming up. We need gas for the, all these power stations all over the Arab world. We barely have four pipelines of gas in the Arab world between countries. Algeria has two to Morocco and Tunisia, but going to Europe. There is the Dolphin gas pipeline, Qatar, UAE, and Sultanate of Oman, and there's the Arab gas pipeline, which is not completed yet. Is this, these are the only pipelines we have throughout the, the Arab world. We need much more. Ga gas is going to be a major consuming, uh, especially for power. We lack power, as we know, and we need more power stations, and they'll be running by gas. I don't think we'll be burning gas oil anymore, hopefully not. I didn't say anything that was not bought by major institutions. I just stated facts. And basically, there has been war all over the place. You take the history of the United States, they had war from the day one up to now. There is not a time in the United States there was not a war, from the Civil War up to now. But the issue is how much money is being spent on war and what this arm is given to these country Access of, power, access of power, for instance, if you get like just the International Institute of Strategic Studies, Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, reflect or estimate that the Arab GCC countries spend 95 billion to 28 billion in military forces in 2017. That's a lot of money. If you look at the numbers and the sale of gas and oil from that region and compare it with the spending on military hardware, then you can see there is a problem in the region. So Where we put our resources and has to be in the right place, I'm saying it's a wake-up call. I know there is a pressure. Somebody is dying to sell weapons from the United States. Donald Trump is not shy about it. He has 600,000 jobs or 3 million jobs he has to sustain at the objection of Congress. He still continues to sell these weapons. What I'm saying, the region is not being protected by more weapons. The region needs peace and negotiation. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. So please thank, join me in thanking this panel for provoking you. <laughs> uh,